Anyway, we'll get on to the ornaments. It's one of the things I'm known for because I do such delicate finials. And uh, the hollow globe is uh, fairly simple to do. Uh, I used to do a round sphere and then I'd put the, the icicle on and the cap on and they kind of looked like they were sitting on top of something. Uh, and then uh, Gary Sanders came here and did a workshop for us and he was doing squash globes. So I started squashing my globes and making them more oval. And then when I put the cap on and the cap on, it finishes the circle. And I found that out in the uh, Florida Symposium in 2000, in one, I guess it was, and one of the people in the audience, an engineer, engineers are okay, by the way, it's difficult to <laughs> But he came back and he's a member of the Mountain Wood Turners, and I was at the Mountain Wood Turners, and he came up to me and said, I know what, why your ornaments look so good, and he went like that, and said, oh, I complete the circle, but I had to listen to 15 minutes worth of <laughs> engineers speak to have him say that, but anyhow, so that's why I like them, and, and uh, when I get turning the parts, it's real critical, to me, to my eye, it's real critical, the diameter of the caps. I don't want them to overpower the globe, but I don't want them to look stuck on. I want them to be right about, you know, just where they should be. This one's wrong, by the way, but uh, the cap's too prominent. But I'll show you about that in a minute. And they come in three parts. You have your uh, hollow globe, which the only reason you hollow the globe is so that it's light and shock value if somebody picks it up and so it will hang on the tree and not bend the branch. Uh, and so we have a hollow globe and I do the globes first and then we have a cap. I don't know if I'm putting this here very well. But, and then we have an icicle and the cap and icicle come out of the same stick of wood and I'll do that in the second part of the demo. Uh, also if you want to practice these things, you don't have to, these are solid wood. You can do solid wood ones, and uh, they're good practice, and you don't have to waste time hollowing, and you can do it all in one part. Uh, I have a class on doing simple ornaments uh, next Thursday at the Woodcraft store, and then uh, Saturday the 24th, I have one on a hollow globe ornament. Uh, there's one person signed up for the simple ornament, so unless I get another student, that class isn't going to happen. Uh, and nobody's signed up for the hollow globe yet, so I'm not sure why people aren't signing up for classes. I mean, if Al Stark can't fill a class, I, I guess I have no business filling a class because Al is excellent. Uh, several years ago, Al Stark did a workshop in my studio, which is really great. And then I had to drive him to Airmont, which is why I had to do it, I don't know. But somebody had to get him there. Right now, what I'm going to do is make a glue block. Uh, normally, I'd show you how to put a foot on and everything, but I'm not going to waste time doing that. Uh, I've got a little mark here on my chuck and a mark on my glue block so that I always put it back where, where it was, so that way it's more likely to stay centered. Uh, it's not guaranteed. Anytime you remount something, it gets off center. First thing I do when I put it on is I'm going to face off the front and I want to make it perfectly flat. And I had a little ruler that I brought with me that set down somewhere, and I don't know where I put it. But usually I'll put, put a straight edge across there to make sure it's perfectly flat. And I guess before you do that, you got to turn the thing. Whoa! Man. Good thing I'm paying attention was in reverse. Good thing I locked my screws in. If you've got a chuck, like a talent chuck, in a, in a, in a lay like the one way where it has a little slot there's little two little set screws here that you can lock your chuck on so if you do want to turn it in reverse it won't fly off the lake luckily i put them on there and i'm turning small stuff the rule of uh rule of thumb for how fast you can go is you take the diameter of your work times the rpms and that product should fall between six and nine thousand this is a one-way lay that only goes up to 3300 rpms so i'm perfectly safe uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch the back of the bell, the heel, to find that surface, and I'm going to shift my weight and find the cut. The fluke is at uh, 3 o'clock and fully closed. Fully open is 12 o'clock, straight up and down, and fully closed. And then slightly open it to find that cut. There it is. Coming to the outside. I'm going to, this is the one time that I lock everything in position, and I very aggressively stick it in. Once I've broken the surface, I can relax that double contact. And I'm going to slide across that surface. Now what you don't know is 
that my thumb's job is to push the tool away from the surface because my right hand is pushing forks into the work, and I don't want any pressure on the bevel. I want bevel contact without pressure. I want to slide across that surface and slice those fibers. The speed I go across this work with the gouge is also in direct relationship to the speed the lay is going. The faster the lay is going, the faster I can slide across that surface. Now I'll put my straight edge on there. Yeah, and I did what I normally did. I kind of concaved it. So I'm going to start with a heavy cut and get lighter and lighter. Uh, the other trick to this is you take as light a cut as you can. It's not about taking big cuts. The thinner that can be too good. The thinner the cut, the better that surface area is. If you have a sharp tool and do this uh, cut right, you guys can't feel this, but that's a mirror finish. If I sanded this with 600 grit sandpaper, it would scratch it. Now, that looks perfectly flat to me. I'm going to go to the halfway point and just make sure it doesn't rot. It's not perfectly flat. So this is probably one of the hardest parts about doing an ornament getting this surface flat, not convex, not concave. If it's got a little dimple in the middle, it's okay. And I want concave again. One more cut and then I'll just show you the next step. You want to do it flat. You need it flat so you get good glue contact. We're going to say that's flat. I'm not even going to check it. For one reason is, I don't have my C8 glue, so I can't glue it anyway. <laughs> All right, what I do, this is a piece of burl. Actually, I think it's one of Mike Smith's pieces of burl. He sells, he sells some of this wood through Clings for, and I picked this up at a very reasonable price. What I did, I saw, saw, uh, cut it on my bandsaw to a smaller black so I don't waste it. And then I took one side and went up to my uh, sanding station, which is really a belt sander up on end, but I got a fancy sanding station, and I just sanded it flat. And normally what I do, Oh, funny, this stuff's going to be pinned. I put some CA glue on here. I use the thick CA glue and I just make a little circle, I mean a little uh, spiral. And then I just smear it all around. And with a block like this, where it's almost the same diameter as the square of the block, I don't worry about it. But if I had a big glue block, sometimes I draw pencil lines on it so I can center the block up on it. So I've got my glue on there. I don't use an uh, uh, activator. I just go straight with the CA glue. I usually put a paper towel on the bed of my lathe. And then I bring the tail stock up and I lock it in place. And I will spray the outside with activator so it doesn't drip all over the lathe. And sometimes I'll put a little extra glue right here on these little corner surfaces just to make sure it's glued on right. And then I'll go to my next lathe and set up a glue block. And then I'll go to my next lathe and set up a glue block. I like to let them sit under pressure for at least three minutes. Uh, if you use the activator, it'll glue up right away, but sometimes the activator makes a weak joint. Uh, but you've got to let it sit at least two or three minutes. And usually what I do is I, I've got three lathes because I teach in my shop. So I'll just go around and start over, and then I'll let all the blocks sit for a while. Well, Frank Pett actually used carpenter's glue and puts them in clamps. That'll work fine, too. Uh, so we'll just pretend that that's all glued up. Get out of here. And the only reason I'm doing this is because the burl is expensive and I hate to waste it. And as much burl as we're using, we're going to run out of it sometime, I would assume. Uh, so this is what it would end up looking like being on a glue block. And this is one partially turned. Oh no, this is, uh, this is out of a solid block of wood. This is uh, just curly maple, so I didn't really feel the need to, to save it. So I'm going to get two globes out of this piece, and I'll probably waste about the width of my thumb, about three quarters of an inch of wood. And the one I'm going to turn. No, I never used hot glue. I don't know So if you're going to turn out a solid wood, get my little cheater thing. You're going to want to turn it between centers first. And then uh, this is a little step center designed to go in your chuck. This way I don't have to take my chuck off. 
it says glue block, but I want to make sure it's not busted. All right. And then you find the center of your work, and that requires a pencil, which... You can use a straight edge, you can go corner to corner, you can use a center finder, or you can use what uh, Terry Brown taught me. I'm going to use my finger as a fence, guess at the middle, go to all four sides, not move anything, and that will show me where the center is. This is the fastest, quickest, and cheapest way to do it because all I have to do is find the pencil. And sometimes that's quite hard to do. And then you want to put a little dimple on there so it'll get into these holes. You don't need a real big one. I'll just give it a little light wrap. This is a, a, a part from a cotton picking machine you can pick up at flea markets. And I sharpened a point on it eight years ago and it's still sharp. And normally I'll look at my piece of wood if there's like some figure or something I want to keep, that's where the globe's going to be. This piece of wood is just a plain piece of maple, it really doesn't matter. You can get it locked on there. I always grab the hand wheel and grab the block. When these step centers, they'll sometimes loosen up on you. So whenever I turn the lathe off, I kind of check it. Then you lock everything in. Whoa. This out of the way. And then, uh, this block is about two inches in diameter, and this chuck will take a, a, I think a one and five eighths foot. I'm going to try to do about one and like three quarters. And somewhere, I got my calipers, and I set them to the opening on the jaws. I like to have the jaws uh, almost all the way closed. So while you weren't looking, when it was almost all the way closed, I set my calipers. And there's not going to be much of a shoulder, and it's the shoulder that holds it in. I turn it by hand to make sure it clears. And I'm going to take light cuts at first. I'm going to touch the heel of the bevel first. I drop that handle further than I think. My thumb's on top of the handle so that it puts pressure on the tool rest. The only place we need is any, the only place we need pressure is on the tool rest. I touch the heel first, I draw it up, there's a cut, and then I just shift my weight. Real careful near the chuck. My, uh, Spindle roughing down. I'm not going to turn it to a complete cylinder because I need a big shoulder. Uh, it's probably easier for you to see this end, so I'm going to put the foot on this end. I only need about three sixteenths to a quarter of an inch uh, wide of a foot, so I've got a quarter inch parting tool here. So I can see about the width of the parting tool. And when you use calipers like these, if you have that handlebar away from you, if it gets caught, it'll slip out of your hand. You do it the other way, it pulls you into the lathe. I just rest that on top. It's about right. And I've got dovetail jaws in my chuck, so I'm going to use my uh, I'm going to use my homemade skew like a scraper. Just pointing straight into the cut. Not the same angle as the jaws on my chuck. The other thing you want to make sure you have is this shoulder should be uh, perfectly flat or maybe slightly concave. Uh, I should see a little bit of light right in the middle. Uh, what really holds it in the chuck is the chuck jaws sitting flat on that outside shoulder. It's not the chuck gripping it that holds it in. So I've got a good one. It's just slightly concave, which is unusual. Usually I do it too much. You shouldn't have your tools on the lathe. Oh. And get my fancy little thing out. Put that in my pocket. I really like step centers. They cost a lot of money. I highly recommend them. And then I'm going to put even pressure on it so it sits flat on those jaws. And I sometimes wiggle it just to make sure I got it in there, good contact. But once again, it's sitting on flat on the top of the jaws and holds it in. And as I go around to, to use both holes, I'm checking to make sure I don't see any light between the top of the chuck and the bottom of my piece. That's good. Now, if you want to be aggressive, it's always a good idea to bring your tailstock back up just to be safe. I really don't need it, but. And I'm going to let it find its new center. 
My lady at home has an on-off switch up here, so you keep seeing me reach over this way, it's because that's where I'm going to turn it off. And I want to get the tool rest in a little bit closer. And the way I do that is I put the corners parallel to the floor, and that shows me my height, uh, my most sticky out part. And I want the tool rest in a height so that when I'm cutting, I'm at or above that most sticky out part. You don't want the material coming into the tool. You want to be able to control the cut. So now I can turn it to a cylinder. Once again, I'm going to try to stay away from that chuck. And I used to do my globes anywhere from two to two and a half inches. And now I'm doing them about an inch and five inches to an inch and a quarter. I'm tending to make smaller ones now. Uh, I think they look a little bit better on the tree. Oh yeah, now the trick is, if you're never turn, not good at turning a sphere, this little trick will help you out. Alan Batty asked me why I bother doing this, why don't I just turn a sphere? And I said, most of my students can't see a sphere in that cylinder. Yeah. The trouble with teaching is when tools go everywhere, they get put back on. So if I were turning a sphere, I would take that diameter and lay it out here and mark down here. But I don't want a sphere, I want a squash globe. So I'm going to knock about 30% off, plus or minus. So that's going to guarantee me a squash sphere. Yep. Now mark that line. Now I'm going to divide it, divide it in half. You measure very accurately. That's got it. Now I'm going to divide it half and half. Very accurate measurements. You've got to be dead on with this. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock those corners off at roughly 45 degrees. Uh, I've got about a 35 degree bevel on here, so it's probably going to be 35 degrees. If you really want to make a perfect sphere, you can measure this distance right here from here to there, and then mark it from here to there, and just go point to point. But I don't need to do that. So I'm just going to knock it. Ooh, well, first thing I'm going to do is part back the back end. Establish my boundaries. I want to leave enough wood back here so that when I hollow, it doesn't start vibrating. So I don't want to take this any smaller than about an inch and a half, inch and a quarter. So what that does is it makes it hard to make a perfectly symmetrical sphere because this one's going to go all the way to, to the end and this one's going to stop. But we'll fix that later. So now it's real easy. Anybody can do this. So this is just not even turning the beads, just knocking the corners off. Knock one side off, then the other. Now you can sort of see this. Now you can kind of see a sphere happen. And whenever you turn a bead, you always start at the outside and work your way back to the center. Although my winter chair uh, instructor starts at the middle and goes all the way around. But what happens if you start in the middle is you got to take a heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier cut, and then all of a sudden you've got too much wood and you can't go anywhere. You start at the outside, take a light cut, and then another cut, and each cut gets longer and longer and longer. It's a whole lot easier. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to knock this edge off right here. I'm just going to knock about an eighth of an inch off. And I'm just going to start working my way around. And you'll notice I'm pointing the tool up in the direction of cut with my body open. And the flute's going to be at about 2 o'clock or 45 degrees, plus or minus a little bit. I'm going to be cutting dead center on the, on the, on the, on the, on the gouge, dead center, or on that bottom wing, the wing towards the floor, the downhill wing, however you want to look at it. Because this is where I'm resting on, the, this is where I'm getting my support, right here on the tool rest. If I touch that upper wing with the wood, it's going to come back on me and be a catch. So I always have to keep that cut at the very tip, or the bottom wing, or the wing away from me, or the wing on the, towards the floor. And once again, in order to make a good beat, I have to slide the tool across the tool rest as I do this. Otherwise, I'll shrink it some more. I'll just, if I just fit it, I'll shrink it. So I touch the heel, draw it back, there's the cut, knock the corner off, now I'm going to bring it all around. I don't have to be cutting all the time, what I'm doing is I'm moving that tool in an arc, and it's taking a little way that it needs to 
go away doing that arc. And as I'm bringing it around, I'm rolling my hips around towards the tail stop. And when I finish this next cut, my body will be parallel to the leg. That automatically brings that handle around. To roll a proper bead, the handle starts down here, pointing up in the direction of cut, and I raise it up as I come around, and it ends up over here. It's kind of like going up like the top of a candy cane. And I'm sliding across that surface. There's no pressure on the bevel. I have bevel contact, but without pressure. I'm gliding along the bevel, sliding along the bevel, and I'm slicing that wood as I go. Now when I go to the headstock side, I'm right-handed. This is where the problem comes for right-handers. Usually on the tailstock side, you have a nice round bead because we have full clearance. When I come to the headstock side, I'm going to bam, I'm right, I can't go anywhere, and my tool hasn't made its full arc yet. So what I have to do is, no leg's perfect, and every leg has a leg right where I, I want my foot right where that leg is, but I'm going to have to put it on, on the other side, and then I'm going to put it in. I'm going to kind of lean into the cut, and then I'm going to roll back. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to arc my hips like this to start the cut, and then when I finish the cut, they're going to be arced the other way so I can get that handle where it needs to be. The bevel always points in direction of cut. So when I start this, the bevel's pointing that way. And when I finish this cut, the bevel is almost not on this side. But if I was going a perfect steer, when I finish that cut, it's going to be almost perpendicular. So that handle, that means that handle has to come over here somehow. So let's get and oh, I skipped a step. I'm trying to go too fast because I want to make sure I get everything in. When I'm rolling the bead towards the tailstock side as a right-hander, I put my finger in the flute, and that way my wrist automatically wants to roll that way. So it's just all automatic. When I come to the headstock side of the bead, I put my finger on the side of the flute so my wrist wants to roll. If I had it in the middle of the flute, the wrist is already gone, and I can't roll that flute closed. Put it on the side, and it's just natural. So we're just going to knock it off. We're going to try to make it symmetrical, but it's not that important. Just a nice, light, easy rolling cut. No pressure on the bevel. That looks good. I'm a little pointed right there, so I'm going to kind of blend it in a little bit. And that was one of the times I wish I had left it alone. I was pretty close to what I wanted. But no, I had to go for perfection, so now I kind of lube it off. All right, now what I would do is get the tool rest out of the way. I would sand this with 120 grit sandpaper. Or, well, actually, this one, no, no, this one would be 150. Whatever grit I need to get the damage out of the way, this doesn't have any damage. I got some ridges here, but ridges sand out in a heartbeat. It's the valleys that don't go away. And then I would take something dark. Oh, should just grab your notebook. And I would put it behind it, and that way I can see my, my outline of my work better. Be sure it's okay. So we're going to assume it's okay. I'm going to go ahead and cut across the front. Flatten that out. Now I'm going to drill a hole in here so I don't have to have it perfect. And I'm going to put a cap on. So I would like this part kind of tending to be a little bit on the flat side. That way I don't have to undercut my cap. Then I'm going to put a little dimple in there with my skew, the corner of my skew. And that way that'll lead in the drill bit. Still wanting to turn it off over there. Ooh, what was that? Oh, well, it's, yeah, it's some off the light post, but I don't see anything that's important that would have been in there. No, anyway, whatever that was. It ain't um, I tend to go with a 5 8 inch hole. Uh, as a beginner, I would suggest using a 3 quarter inch hole because you have more room to get in. Uh, and one of my students said my cap's going to cover it up. My cap's usually about an inch big, so I could actually go with a 3 quarter inch hole. 
one of my students said, why don't you go to a three quarter inch hole? Because there's no challenge in that. I guess, I said, I don't know. And I like to get the quill out about the width of my finger so it locks in that Morse taper. And I'll slide it up and stop just shy of my ornament. And then put this in my pocket. I did get a little bit of good for this. And this is the other one. I don't know how to describe how I do it. <laughs> Fire and head calipers out. Oh, well, once again, I'm going to take. I'm going to kind of. I like my globes to be about uh, 16th, 16th of an inch to eighth of an inch thick. So I kind of put the calipers up here so it looks like there's an eighth of an inch on either side. In other words, I'm not going all the way around full circle here. I'm just trying to kind of cut it, <coughs> kind of guess at it. And then I go with the, the wings of the drill bit. I measure from them, not the tip. And I put my tape down. And then I double check it. And if my tape's a little shy or a little bit too far in, then I just remember I have to drill into the tape or stop shy of the tape. Lower the lay speed, uh, probably somewhere around three, three to five hundred RPMs. Uh, I guess I'm going about seven. It's hard to tell with the one. One hand holds the chuck in place because the vibration will loosen the mortise taper. And then I'll bore in. Sometimes this squeals like crazy. If you, if you want to get the shavings out, don't use your finger, use a stick. You're not boring me into the tenant. You're going to stop. I'm, just, I'm stopping shy. Uh, what Todd was asking, uh, what's his name? Bob Roseanne drills all the way through and then parts his globe off. I'm stopping shy so that when I'm done, I'm going to take my tenon down smaller than the drill bit, and you'll see it. And then I'll bore it off, and my globe will sit on my drill bit. I won't have to catch it. If I drilled all the way through and parted it, i got to have my hand over here, which is dangerous, and i got to catch my globe. With my method, I don't have to catch it. My method is an extra step. It costs extra time. But it's safer. But it's, it's safer. You don't lose your globe, and, and you get a cleaner cut on the exit. Because if you're using burl, burl doesn't really have any structure. And sometimes when you part it off, when it's been drilled through, it'll be all crumbly on the hole. So this way, I get a much, more, much cleaner exit. So my next step is I board it out is I gotta hollow it, which means I gotta get uh, stuff out of here. And get that out of the way. Hopefully I won't hit your. Oh, you taking it off? Yeah, I gotta take it off. Which I don't have on sample. Anyhow, yeah, that's a whole nother. Volume. I'm not going to get into all that. That's, what you, that's why you take a class with me. I can show you all the tricks because one of the students is going to do something and we get to do tricks. <laughs> in my beginning class, I teach at the folk school. I had a more advanced student and he was complaining about uh, it being so basic and he wasn't getting anywhere. I said, let's get to Tuesday and then I'll start working with you. And he started messing up and I got to show him all kinds of tricks at the end of the week. He said, ah, I learned a lot. He said, I told you. Come around behind you here. Yeah, the reason I like to have the legs at an angle is so these folks over here can see my body position. Because body position is critical in turning. Uh, most people want to focus in on a cut and it tells you absolutely nothing about where the tool is or where my body is. And I really don't think you need to look at my face. I'd rather have you watching how I work. Although now it's not going to work for anybody. The only people can see it right here now. I'm going to try to get this set up so my tool is horizontal, it's hitting dead center. Because you want to be cutting at center or slightly above. That looks good. I like to, when I'm using a scraper, put my hand on top of the tool. That way, if I get a catch, I can't get hit in the head. This is just a round nose scraper. Four inch round nose scraper. I use this to get as much wood out of there as possible because it's, it's, it's directly supported on the, on the tool rest where the cut is. Uh, I'm also spreading my legs out. Well, the other thing is, you don't want to look in the hole. Because when I look in the hole, I drop my handle and I'm no longer horizontal. With a scraper, you do not want bevel contact for the most part. There are times when you can cheat on these rules. 
Uh, so you want to keep it horizontal or tilt it down into the cut. You never drop it like that. If you tilt it down too much and get below center, then it's going to go airborne. And uh, it's not fun. So, uh, yeah. That's what I have on there. You probably can't see it. Uh, Bob asked about negative rake. What I do is I have a 70 degree bevel or 80, 70 to 80 degree bevel on the front. And then I've cut back about 5 to 10 degrees on the top, which is called a negative rake. Uh, if you've ever done a, a V cut with a skew, the first time you try to stick that skew in there, you can only go in about a sixteenth of an inch. I don't care how hard you shove it, it's not going any further because it's a wedge. That negative rake does the same thing here. When I hit that end grain dead on, it doesn't get sucked into it. Uh, it's not as grabby, it's a lot, a lot more forgiving. <coughs> it's going to get hard to get used to it. And I like to leave about an eighth of an inch up top to do the top on. Uh, in my mind, visually, when I'm turning this ornament, this is the top. But usually what happens when I hollow, I get this very thin, so there's not much glue surface. Uh, it hangs by the top, so I want a better glue surface on the top, so the bottom all of a sudden becomes the top. Whichever side has the best glue surface is at the top. So I made that mark. Hopefully it'll still be there when I'm done. I'm going to hog as much wood out as I can at a proper speed. We're pretty far away from the chuck, so we're probably going to pick up a little bit of vibration. And what I'm doing is I'm arcing in there parallel to this. And I can feel when I hit that drill hole, and I don't want to drill, uh, I don't want to hollow down into here and break my ornament. So I'm doing it all by feel. So that's enough for that tool. This is just a quarter, uh, Sorry, quarter trying. round bar. You need me to step back to say so. No, no, I'm just, I'll be fine. Let me figure it out. Well, uh, this is part of a set of three that you can get from Packard. Well, one's at 80 degrees, and one's been at 45 degrees, and one's straight. The problem with the ones you buy from Packard is they come about a half an inch longer than these are right now. And if you try to stick those inch and a half long guys into this globe, it's going to pop on you because it's going to have too much torque because you're, you're, you're uh, cutting too far off of where your support is. Well, when they're ground like this, they work out pretty well. Uh, I don't recommend this set anymore just because if I'm not there to grind it back for you, you might get hurt. Uh, but once again, I got a negative rake on them all. And with this set, what I used to do is the 45 degree one would do from right about here all the way to just shy of the bottom. The 80 degree one would do from the very top edge to about the center. And I'd work my way that way. And we have to leave some wood for you to see these other tools. Cindy's out. Gail's out. Okay. This is a simple tool you can make yourself. Uh, it's just a machinist bit, an eighth inch machinist bit. And this is cold rolled steel, drilled at 45 degrees. Uh, Al Basham drilled back the other way and put a little set screw in here so he can pull it out. Uh, what David Ellsworth does is he just glues the bit in with a hot, C, uh, thick CA glue. And then when he needs to take it out to sharpen, he just heats it up and pulls it out. It's a very aggressive tool. Oh, I forgot my uh, straw. Gotta have my. Uh, oh god, it's probably at home. Tool press. Oh. I'll have to use my my backup compressor. My normal compressor I left home. I have a plastic tube I use with tape on one end, so I remember which end goes in the hole. So you need to blow it out. It's my port new portable compressor. It's exhale all the time, right? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta exhale all the time. Breathe in before you stick it in the hole. <laughs> and this guy's very aggressive. You can do the hole inside. It's a much smaller cutting surface, but it takes way more wood out than any of the other tools a lot quicker. It's very aggressive. And once again, I'm rocking it back and forth. Uh, mimicking that outside curve. Now, is the bottom flashing at all? I mean, what keeps it from? Uh, this is like this is like those other tools. It's not supported here, so yeah, it won't, does want to torque over a bit, okay. but it's not that far out. You flatten the bottom like oh, the bottom rod. Yeah, so it wouldn't. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, yeah, you can take it to the grinder or sanding station and flatten it. Okay. 
I mean, I was just wondering. I never thought of what doing that. Keep it for well, it's not, you're just taking light cuts and it's an eighth inch cutter, so it's not as much torque as a quarter inch cutter. If you had a quarter inch cutter in here, it would flip right over on you. And this guy is easy to control. Yeah, he was talking about flattening the bottom of it so it won't torque over. Getting ahead of me, buddy. He's, this is uh, Dale Nish's tool. This is what he uses for his bird houses and his small hollow forms. Uh, you get this for, only from craft supplies because Dale Nish's son owns craft supplies, so he doesn't sell it anywhere else. And what they've done is they ground it back here. So when you're resting on a tool rest here, your cut is in line with your support, so it doesn't torque over. It's cut back in so you can angle in here and get in here and hollow. He's got uh, three or four different sizes of them. The smaller two are the ones I use the most. I think there's one just smaller than this, but I don't see it sitting there. And once again, it works. This will work probably pretty much the whole globe. It's a whole lot easier to use because it's totally supported. And I guess with a straw in my mouth, you can't hear me very well. It's real easy to get a nice smooth wall in there, not that it matters. Now, Cindy Drozda, you can get this at Packard, uh, has quite a similar tool with her name on it, although she's already put a negative rake on it all the way around on hers. Uh, with Dale Nishes, I put my own negative rake on. And it works the same way as Dale's. Uh, and it works the same. And Frank Penny usually like takes quarter inch steel and have a glass where he heated up and he put angles. The other day on these tools are really more for hollow forms. They get a lot bigger and I haven't used this one yet. I don't have a negative break on it. Uh, we're going to call that done with the howling. So, blow it out one more time. Automatic. And now what do I do? I guess you're going to want to be back over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Give me a sec. Four cameramen are enough to do. Only if we're paying attention. When I was in, uh, I got invited to demonstrate at SWAT down in Texas, Southwest Winters. Yeah, whatever it is. Anyway, they had these fancy things set up with cameras. Two clubs, the same setup. The camera was up here. Well, I'm turning here all the time. All I saw was my head and whatever was calling around on it. They didn't have one club at least had a free camera so he could move around and, and it'll work with me. But, you know, it's just like, I can't. And I said, they said they'd never had a spindle turn before. Oh, jeez. And I said, Come SWAT's on. 12 years old. No way. Your Texas turning clubs are older than that. And you haven't had a spindle turn? Oh my god. Anyway, now what I'm gonna do is hollow the inside. Oh god, I forgot. I'm trying to go quick, there's a lot to do. These are real fancy gauges. By the way, I have handouts up there. You probably didn't see them, but I got really good handouts. Uh, these are the gauges. There's a little diagram in the back uh, to scale. I uh, did a put them on my copy machine and copied them so I get it done right. Uh, Terry Brown's the one that sort of showed me these shapes and I taught a class here at the craft center and we made our own gauges and then somebody walked away with my prototypes. So I had to go back to Terry and figure out how to make them again. And I've almost got them right. This one's supposed to be a little bit more elongated, but this one with the bent crooked thing, they'll do the top part to the middle and it's spring loaded. You set that gap about where you want it. I set it a little bit, about a 30 second uh, wider than I want it. And right now, this, th this globe is exactly that thick. It's too thick for me, but I'm not gonna waste your time hollowing anymore. But this gauge does the top. And in the beginning, when you're doing these things, check often, more often than you think. Because normally you're gonna go up through the, you're gonna go through right here or right down here on the bottom. So you always wanna check. And then this one will do, going this way, he'll do the bottom. And my bottom is thicker than that, so the bottom is way too thick, but we're not gonna worry about that. And I made them out of coat hangers, very expensive gauges. You gotta get a shirt dry clean. Uh, but they don't make anything else that, uh, they don't make gauges that really fit in there. 
So I've hollowed it. Now I'm going to take this tenon down to about the size of the drill bit. Need a little extra room so I can get in there and cut my curve. And whenever you're doing a part, you always want to open it up so you don't trap your tools. A lot of times when I teach a class, I get my tools back and they're all black on both sides because the student went in there and didn't open up the hole. And that's really dangerous because your tool can get pinched. Now I'll take my spindle gouge and I'm going to finish off this curve. I think when I get some spare money, I'm going to buy a remote control for this guy for you guys. And luckily I left it fixed so I can take some extra wood off of here, but if you had gone and turned it to a proper wall thickness, you could not have taken that big of a cut that I just take to. So once again, I want that bottom a little bit flat. Oh, the other thing I do is see these sharp edges. Before I sand this guy, I knock those guys off, break those corners. Don't hit that big red button, or the lid will have to turn it off. Uh, I don't know, I got sandpaper. This is the wrong kind of sandpaper. This is that 3X. Should be using that wonderful gold stuff and get a clean sport. Although I like the 3X just as well. Uh, Fine Woodwork, we did a test on sandpaper. And they like the 3X best. Clean sport was right up there with it. Clean sport is cheaper than the 3X, so they put clean spores paper up top. So. And they have it in a big bin in the back, of the back of the room. You can buy it by the pound. The gold's what you want. But anyway, when I sand, I put one of these scotch bright pads behind the sandpaper. That does a couple things. One is it stiffens the paper. The other one is it kind of air conditions it or, or keeps it cool. A lot of times they recommend you fold it four times and do that. And you burn your fingers and you burn the paper. This way it stays cool. It stiffens the paper so it doesn't, it, it, it gets rid of all the high spots. And I'll go ahead and sand it like that. I'll start with whatever grit I need to start with. Uh, in theory, you can skip skip one grit, but you, know, you can't skip more than two grits, but you can skip one. I go from, if I start out at 120, I go 120, 150, 180, 220, 320, 400. Then I skip grit, I go to six and 15. Once you get to the higher ones, it's not gonna make that much difference. And then I take my scotch brake pad, I have a gray one, I don't know, oh yeah. Normally I use the gray one. And when I finish sanding all the way up to 1500, then I go ahead and hit it with a gray one because it's got a different scratch pattern. Because I don't want to see those little lines in there. And then this is a gold that you can get at the auto body paint supply houses. And then I go ahead and hit it with that. And I haven't even gone to 1500, but you can already see I'm getting a shine. And then, and then, uh, uh, somebody said that that white, that white uh, uh, Scotch Bright pad is the is the finest they make. So now I hit it with the white green, too. Green, red, Green's gray. coarse. Green, green, and red are coarse. The gray, the gold, and then the white. Okay, White's so the finest, I've been told. But I thought this was the finest. But. So anyway, I go ahead and sand it all the way up. Now I'm happy with it. Now I'm going to take that tenon down to smaller than the drill bit. Normally I use calipers, but I'm going to do it by eye. And I'm going to go straight across so I can have it flat right here. Of course, you check, check with your gauge to make sure there's still enough wood back here to be able to take any more off the back side. Sometimes they get the bottom pretty thin. And then now we bring the tool rest back. This is where you need the young guy. And you want to try to lift with your knees, not your back. The uh, nice thing about the new Powermatic is this thing spring-loaded so it doesn't lock up on you. Same with the, uh, I think the uh, arm is too. Don't need the tape anymore. Usually when I turn the ornaments and I go in the house, it feels funny walking on the wood floors because I got these wads of tape stuck to the bottom of my shoes. Oh, what? oh, that's, that's going, what's going on? I didn't have the quill out all the way so it wasn't locked in the Morse taper. It looked like it was about a half inch below the globe. And what I do is I turn it by hand to feed that drill bit in there because as I take wood away, it'll go out of shape. And if I just turn the lathe on and try to run it in there and it's out of round a little bit and that one wing catches and the other one doesn't, she's gone. So I just 
feed it into the hole until it hits bottom. You hit bottom, I back it off, grab the hand. Can't remember if I lower the lay speed. Lower the lay speed. And now I'll just bore it off. And now I don't have to catch it. And yeah, I'm way too thick on the bottom. And then I kind of gently, if my wings are getting dull, sometimes my bits get dull, I kind of gently just bring it to get a good clean cut. And now you can see, oh, that's terrible hollowing, but anyway. You can see, once again, the bottom is thicker than the top was, so that's, this is how I'd want to hang it, wherever I get the best glue joint. So that's the glow. We probably want to take a break, don't we? And I can yeah. do the spindle afterwards. Yep. yep. Good timing on the break, huh? Hey folks, um, Ed has kindly filled in for Lars tonight, but there's a sheet. So if you brought a piece to the gallery, please write your name, tell us what kind of wood it was. I have no idea where that came from. I think it came from the lamp. They look like you stuck on it. Are you going to do the critique, Al, or somebody else? No, somebody else. I'm not very nice. Sure you are. Not too much of Hey, Chris. I'm very nice, but I need critiques. I forgot, I knew I was looking around for another hollowing tool. These are hunter tools. They have those little uh, carbide uh, cutters on them that uh, you just loosen them up and twist them around. You never sharpen them. When they get dull, you buy some new ones. They'll life, you know, they'll last for years. He's got uh, a straight one, a, a really big curved one, and then a littler curved one. Uh, they work pretty good. I haven't really had a chance to really use them a lot. Uh, this one is for finishing cuts because it's already got that big set at a scraping angle. The other one is uh, fairly flat. So this one will give you that shear scrape, and this will just do your regular scraping. Uh, it's fairly reasonably priced. It's a set of three tools. Comes with a little, uh, little, rent, a little rent, uh, star wrench to undo the bits. Uh, it's Hunter Tool Company. And, uh, it's similar to the Easy Rougher tools. I think Hunter came out before Easy Rougher came along, but Easy Rougher's got better marketing, kind of taking over the market. But these are small scale, so you can use them for little stuff. And, uh, I own a stool for those. That's kind of a raw deal, but anyhow. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn the finial. Finial and the cap. Here's another cap. Turn your left foot. Finial and the cap out of this block of wood, out of this block of wood. And they're going to come out of it like this. So hopefully I don't waste any wood and get them both out. Sometimes you have to put another piece of wood in. So the first thing I got to do, is I'm going to put my step center in here and I like to use one of these things and clean out the uh, Morse taper. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, if I'm not throwing stuff on the floor, I'm not doing a good demo. So. It's a little up. It's a Morse taper cleaner, right? Yeah, it's a Morse taper cleaner. Packard and Craft Supplies carry them. They're like 15 bucks, but they clean them out good. With a one-way lathe, you have to have a number two Morse taper and a number three. I'm going to be using uh, my step jaws. Uh, these are uh, I like these better than the tower jaws because what happens with these tower jaws? is my students over tighten them and eventually they bend out and don't hold anymore. With the step jaws they have all this support and then I can also use these three different levels stair steps kind of to expand into something which if I'm quick I can show you that. I can show you how to do a little uh, base. And I like to have my jaws inside the chuck if I can so I'm going to make a tenon that's going to fit this hole. So I'm just measuring it with the calipers. Yeah, these don't have a locking pin, so I'll set this over here. And then now we're back to that old uh, speedy fine centers. My center finding jig is somewhere in my toolbox. I forgot to get it out. And then once again, I just need a little dimple. I don't need a big old huge dimple because that's a very sharp point, and that's a very sharp point. If I make a big old dimple in here, it's kind of wallow it out. I'm also going to look at my blank and see if there are any defects. It uh, looks like a pretty evenly even piece of wood. The grain's going fairly straight. So I'm going to put the foot on this end. Sometimes there's a defect, so you'll put the foot on where the defect is. And then I like to hold the blank up here. This is a step center, it's a spring loaded pin. So I have to push the pressure back into it. So I like to put one thumb on my uh, bearing center. Sometimes called a live center, but it's a bearing center. And then I grab the hand wheel and wiggle my blank. If it doesn't wiggle or tighten up. And I lock the lathe down. And then I'll set those corners so they're parallel to the floor. That way I know where my most sticky out part is. Bring my tool rest up. I want to make sure the tool rest overhangs at least the width of my finger on both ends. If the piece is longer than my tool rest, Whichever ever end I'm going to be working at, I want the tool rest to be over about the width of my finger. That way I don't fall off the tool rest. <coughs> that always gets my heart going if I fall off the tool rest when I'm turning. And I use my finger for a measurement a lot of times. You need to have the quill out at least the width of your finger so that locks the Morse taper. And I spin it by hand. We're set to go. Find my roughing gouge wherever we went. Uh, tenon's going to go here. So I can turn this to a cylinder. Well, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to put the tenon here. Because what I like to do while I'm trapped between centers is I want to turn it into a shape like that. Because between centers I can be really aggressive. So I'm going to put my foot on the back end so you guys aren't going to get to see me make the foot. But I can use that cone to get really small. So we're off and running. Oh, I may have to... Uh... Yeah, I pushed the red button. So we got 30 seconds to talk. I push the red button. We're not supposed to do that. Anyway, with my spindles, I pretty much have stuck with this two teardrops, then a flat plate, then a sphere, and then a flat plate. Because uh, I haven't thought of anything uh, more interesting to do. Uh, Monday, on my Mondays, I go to Cling Sport and turn all day. So if anybody has questions, they can drop by and ask me questions. Well, I don't really get paid for it. I just go there to get out in public. Uh, and I worked out something that was different, and I brought it in, and I dropped it and broke it so you don't get to see it. And then I set it aside somewhere so I could show it to you, but I don't remember where I put it. But anyway, I'm trying to work on a different design. Usually up in here I do something completely different, because I want them all to look like they're one-offs and not production pieces. And hopefully that was 30 seconds. Oh, that's what I'm that's the one drawback of these one-way lays. If you forget and hit the red button, you're up to creep. Uh oh, I think you push it in hard enough. I like my old one-way lay that doesn't have two start on and off things. It just has up here. I'm not used to having to turn my box on. Oh, well, this is about one inch in diameter, so I can go the fastest lay to let me go, but this sounds about right to me. 
screw Batty likes to say, he turns it up until he feels suicidal, and then he hits it up another knot. I turn it up until I feel uncomfortable and then back off a little bit. And I'm going to do a couple inches at a time. I'm not going to start down here and try to plow through the wood. If you're left handed, it's probably more comfortable going the other way. Again, I'm dropping that handle, touching the heel, and then finding the cut. When I get to the headstock, I go that way. I always have to go from the largest to the smallest diameter. Once I throw up in the corners, I'll go both ways. And what I like to do, the nice thing about this spindle roughing gouge is it's the bottom third of a circle, and then it has two half inch flats. I can lay it at about 45 degrees on that flat. Rest it on the bell, we'll find that sweet spot. And I get almost the same cut that you get if you use the skew. And just to show you, with a skew, Generally on the skew, you want to use the bottom half of the blade. Uh, I usually tell people a bottom third and don't let the heel get in there. The long points the toe, the short points the heel. And it's not sitting flat on the, on the tool rest, it's sticking up a little bit. Once again, I, I make contact with the bevel. This is the better cut. But if you're going to sand, it really doesn't matter which one you use because this cut, if you hit it with sandpaper, will be the same as this stuff if you hit it with sandpaper. The other thing I'd like to show you, this is your traditional skin, and this is the Allen Lacer version. Uh, for the first quarter, quarter, quarter to one third of the width of the blade, that edge is perpendicular, and then it arcs away. Point to point, it's still 70 degrees. When I use a regular skew going towards the tailstock, I have to get way over here because this tool has to point like that in order for that blade to be at 45 degrees. The beauty of the Allen Lacer is I don't have to get squinched up. I'm almost, I'm almost perpendicular with that tool and the blade is at 45. The other beauty is if I get above that halfway point, that upper blade is still going away from the cut and I don't get a cat. With this guy, if I get above that halfway point, it goes bam. You don't want to do that. So this is much friendlier. And by having that flat in there, you can go ahead and do a peeling cut. Which, if I had it like Richard Rafton, it was an arc, a full arc from tip to toe, you couldn't do that peeling cut. It would all be arc. Now Alan Lacey came up with this in his travels of teaching. He always goes and visits uh, people's shops to see what kind of tools they're using, and he saw that grind, and he started using it. The bad thing about putting the foot on his back end is there's no light back here. So we'll have to hope that I did that right. I mean, we'll get our straight edge out. Check it. And as far as I can tell, it's right, but once again, there's no light. If it rocks like this, then it's not, it's going to not sit in the chuck right, but it's flat. I don't need the light, I'll be all right. But it was sitting flat, so we'll be okay. Oh, it's going to be light, I must have just... Yeah, it looks good. Have Although, you turned your roughing gouge upside down? Do <coughs> you use that as a seat? No, I don't turn it upside down, I use it just the way I do it. Yeah, he's asking if I turn it upside down like that and use it like a skew. I don't see any reason to do that when I can do it this way and see what I'm doing. It makes no sense to me to put it upside down like you can see what I'm doing. There's a couple of cuts. There's a couple of cuts that that works pretty good. Well. Now I'm going to go ahead and paper it. You want to do a delicate spinny or you want to paper it more than you think. Now you can feel aggressive while I'm trapped between the centers. Now, the dangerous thing is when I'm up here, coming down the slope, this is where I'm resting on the tool rest. If that upper wing catches in there, it's going to come back at me. And I'm pointing the tool away from the slope as I roll it open. This is a curl cut. If I come down that slope, I'll roll the food open. A lot of times I'll do that little part of the, of the gouge. We'll call that good enough. I'll turn it off, get the chuck in here. 
see if I can start speeding up a little bit. So what's the key to getting and not going to the left? Was the, to rub it initially? No, I, I make sure I'm pointing away from the slope and I don't, and I walk away from the slope. Right, so if you touch the slope. So my, my, it, my first cut would be up. right here. Yeah. My next cut would be further in. Uh -huh. My next cut further away, I run away from it. Okay. If I need it tighter, I'll just go in with a spindle gouge. I didn't get the knockout bar out of the hole. Because I've had to go left there and I wasn't quite sure why. That's because it caught on that upper wing, so I just run away from the slope. Normally in a demo I catch on it so you get to see it, but I didn't do it this time. Yeah, I like having catches and things like that when I do my demos, because that just makes it easier for you all when you get one to know that everybody has it, it's not just you. I remember Nick Cook demonstrated for the Mountain Wood Turners, and I have to sit in the front row because my guest and her husband want me to sit with them for some reason. My host, I mean. And so Nick knew was all, and he kept looking at us, and I counted his catch. to go, oh, there's a catch, Nick. In the course of the day, he had seven catches with his skew. <laughs> the last one was a little itty bitty one. He thought he was going to get away with it. I said, no, Nick, I heard it. You had another catch. <laughs> And the thing with a skew when you're using a skew, most people hold it too tight. It's a delicate tool. You want a light touch. Uh, generally what happens when you get a catch is when you pick up the skew again, you grip it tighter than when you had the catch, which guarantees you're going to get the catch twice as fast. And then you grip it even tighter, which guarantees you're going to get a catch. The tool is a delicate tool. You want to have a nice, nice light touch. No need for force with the skew. All right. So I'm going to let it find its new home. I'm just trying to turn it on over here. Just want a little extra support. Get in close to my tool rest of the lathe off. Never move the tool rest of the lathe on unless you want to ruin your piece and maybe yourself to boot. And what we were talking about before, I wish I had lost my When I'm sitting right here doing this cut, this is where my support is. That's where the cut has to be. If this wing right here makes contact, which it just did, it's going right. to come right back right. on you. So what I try to do is I'll walk away from it. So instead of starting at the top, I'm going to start down here. And my next cut's going to start even further. And if I want that to be sharp or curved, uh, I try to remember where I put my spindle gouge. And then I'll just, just with a cold cut, you start with a, with a cold cut, or a concave cut. You start with the flute closed and you roll it open. I should push the cutting edge away from the slope. Now, the way I like to describe this is that none of you are going to understand it because you're all going to be looking at the cutting edge. When I start this cut, the flute is closed, the bevel is sometimes perpendicular. In a case like this where I'm going nice and easy slope, I'll have it kind of pointing that way. But I still start with that flute closed. And what I'm going to do is when I'm on the tailstock side, I'm going to be pulling the handle down and towards me as I roll the flute open. Pulling the handle down and towards me. Pushing that cutting edge away from the slope. When I'm on the tailstock side, I'm going to be pushing the handle down and away from me as I come down that slope. And it's a whole lot easier to understand and to try to see what's happening in here. Usually what happens is the camera's focusing right on that edge. And you have no idea what that handle's doing, but I'm just dropping and rolling. and I'm. I'm just scooping out that, that ice cream, or like, you know, being a Yankee, I'm, I'm taking that, that bobsled and I'm hitting that curve and it's throwing me around. Here in NASCAR countries, it's just like those cars hitting those curves. It just goes around like that. It's just a, a nice scooping thing. And my left hand is not locked onto this tool. My left hand is just like a bridge and pull. My thumb's going to be pushing away from the slope gently as my right hand kind of twists open, open the tool and feeds it off the leg. All very gentle, no force, no pressure. If you bumped into me or grabbed onto this tool, it'll come right out of my hand. And I'm not locked on. Now, a lot of times if I'm doing a tight cove like in a baluster, when I start this cut, I am locked in until I break that surface. Because if I open up the foot too much, it's going to go and chase a thread. But here, when I'm pointing kind of down the slope already, I don't have that problem. So I don't have to lock on. It's very gentle. And some of you have probably took that course with uh, that guy from Georgia. 
yet. Who unfortunately is not one to get into discussion, but we're using the same techniques despite the fact that he tells me I'm doing it all wrong. I'm doing it the way the English and Germans have been doing it for hundreds of years. Well, we're using the same principle, but I couldn't explain it to him. He said, the minute I put my left hand on there, I'm putting pressure on the bevel. That's normally what would happen, but the way I have my fingers on here, the only pressure I have is down onto the tool list. It's not in here. still slicing. We're doing the same moves. He's got a convex bevel. What I've done, oh yeah, I want to mention this. I've done a little relief back here. Normally with a 3 8 inch spindle gouge, that bevel would be about a half an inch to 5 eighths of an inch long at the 30 degree angle I have on it. I've ground off the back of it. I don't care what angle that back is. And I shrunk that bevel so it's about a quarter of an inch. Uh, what's his name? Francois. John Francois. He's got like a, shoot, a 16th at, oh, yeah. at most bevel on his gouge. And he can do all kinds of stuff with it. I, I, need, I need an eighth to a quarter of an inch or I can't find it. Stuart Batty and uh, Mike Mahoney, they'll use a sixteenth. But I need, I need like three sixteenths to a quarter of an inch or I can't find it. My students need a little bit more. But I get that out of there so that way I can take a tighter, I can do a tighter arc and a tighter curve that I normally have to drop down to one of these little tiny gouges to do. So it just makes it a lot, a lot easier. You have less bevel contact. Sometimes I might even take my hone if I'm trying to not leave ridges on here, and I'll just hone the back of the heel. Because sometimes you end up getting little ridges, but I don't have any ridges. You know, it's the exact same thing he's doing, but we couldn't discuss it. I was all wrong, so. Anyway. No, I think you and Mark are we're very similar to me. It's real similar. That's why I just really wished I could have had a discussion with him. But. Like talking, to I, his, I like talking to a surgeon, you know, that's it. Know what he was talking Decision about. is made. Yeah. I'm all about studying how it's done and why somebody else is doing it different and how that may benefit me. And what I try to share is the things I found that make my turning a lot easier. And I'm always learning something new. Even for people who don't know how to turn, I'll pick up a little tip because they may see things a little bit differently than I do. Especially non-woodworkers, they have a whole different different insight. So I always try to listen to everybody and I take what I think I can use and throw away the rest. It took me a whole day to try to Well, I had, a, I had that nice pencil that you can see, but it's on the floor somewhere. Usually what I do to give myself some idea where I'm going is make a few marks. You'll find out shortly these are meaningless. But they at least get me in the ballpark. I'm going to do a little teardrop here. First, I had a little, that little dimple. She was done that before I made my marks. I want to make sure I don't have that dimple. These are going to be cold cuts, scooping it out. And unlike the books say, you can see I'm already below the axis of the lathe, but that's because I'm pointing my tool up in the direction of cut. I'm still cutting at the center. Or above. Now, the thing I found is all, all of you could probably do a delicate finial. The problem with doing delicate finials is once you've done a delicate one, you can't do a fat one. <laughs> to me, this is, this is a no-no for me. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's too fat for me. Because I know I can do better. And I don't feel comfortable when I sell somebody work that's not my best. And now I'm going to do a little half knee. And I'll do another little curl. i got to be really gentle because if I bump into that back of that half knee, I'll pop it, pop it off. Now when I get close to it, what I'll do is I'll bring the handle up so that only the tip of the tool hits the back of it, just the tip, not the wing. There's no problem. Now I'll clean it up. And you have to be gentle. You have to have quick depth perception. If you're wearing bifocals, you might need to get a, uh, a different prescription because the leg is about six inches further away than your reading, reading is. And the main reason I know that is I have a lot of students that have bifocals and they're kind of sitting there looking for where the tool is. And it's just out of their focus range, focal range. 
If you're lucky and both eyes have the same problem, you can buy the uh, safety glasses that have uh, 2X or 4X lenses. And once again, I got double contact, and I'm slicing that wood off. I'm not scraping. And now I'm gonna have, I'm gonna cut the back side of this beam, and I'm gonna start. My bevel's gonna be perpendicular. I'm gonna cut a flat plate in. Now somebody once told me that this shouldn't be, that cut shouldn't be flat. This cut shouldn't be straight in. It should be angled like a diamond. Uh, and I didn't want to bother you as a person that, that you can't explain things to. But I find that that flat plate's a lot harder to do than one of these. And I like that flat edge. I don't want a sharp edge. I don't like sharp things. Except for turning tools. By the way, Sunday I have a, a sharpening class at Clay School. Now, right now, I get the tool rest out of the way. So you're trying to go for fins that are flat? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I like, I like them flat. I like those flat plates flat. I don't want them sharp and diamond. That one's a little bit diamondy. This is better. I like it straight on, perfectly. So I've sanded these two all the way to completion, and then never touch them again. That's why I'm using maple for this demo, because it's cheap enough, because this is going to be a reject. Because I don't cut well enough to not sand. I'm going to cut in the back side of that black plate, and the first one or the other one. Get some of that wood out of the way. I don't want the spear to be too big. Now, when I first did these things, I couldn't turn a good bead, so the spear, I would sand it. I sand it round. Now what happens when I sand is I get it unround. You can pass that around if you want. Oh yeah, right now I'm holding the tool way far back. I like to choke up on my tool. When I'm doing a little stuff, I don't need to hold the end of the handle. I don't need all that leverage. Once again, the uh, bevel's perpendicular. And I'm kind of slicing in. I'm dropping the handle and then lifting it up and just slicing in. It's a little trick I learned from Nick Cook. That way I don't end up skating. Oh, I did a terrible job on that. We're just playing it on me talking while I'm turning. Now put in that other flat plate, put in another tool drop. Yeah, you gotta pay attention to the tool is. I just kind of messed up a little bit, but I think I'll be all right. But I'm not gripping this tool for dear life. And I try to make the flat plates the same thickness if I can. And I try to make each teardrop get a little bit bigger as I go up. I find it I'm 
shifting my weight around, not just moving my arms. And I'm going to kind of do a little bit of chin here. I almost turned the camera off. One thing I have to do is I get my flow, and I have lots of scrap tops from demos. And I try to put one on and see if the diameter of the top fits the shape, the, the size of the globe I'm going to use. And if it's too big, I think this one's just a hair too big, I'll set my calipers. Shrink them down just a hair. It makes it a whole lot easier when I can put something on and really get a direct visual. So I need to get rid of some of that wood. And usually it caps a little bit bigger than the uh, bicycle. With these kind of calipers, you do not want to put them on with a lathe moving because they can get trapped on there and go flying. That's about where I want to be. Clean it up. Now let's try to do something a little bit different. Up here at the uh, roll bin. So they all look neat. Uh, in the past, what I did with my uh, icicles, keep them both away, is I would have this curve here kind of match or fix whatever was wrong with my globe. This curve right in here. But now I've started doing a different technique where I do a little OG which I discovered makes it work out much better because it, it, it fits in almost any sphere. So I'm going to do a little code in here instead of a convex curve like I used to do. Come on. You know, I kind of tend to do a little bell shape up here. One problem with doing this little OG in here When I undercut the back side, if I undercut it too much, I lose the whole thing. Now one little trick, I'm not going to try to make this perfect, one little trick I like is this homemade uh, skew. On the other end I have a point tool. I'm going to go in and clean up. Move. should have done that earlier. You really can't go back once you come back here, but I just had to go in. You can see the difference it made right there, taking that nice, crisp shadow line in there. Uh, just a little tidbit here. <coughs> Guys, if you want to try to lock that hand down, you take your little piece of plastic, take this uh, tail, which I've uh, sent her off, the cone off, and the pin out, and then this will go right in the end of that. Then you can slide this right up over here, make this to fit as a wedge so that you can do it on different ones. So you know what I mean. Oh, I see. And that'll hold, yeah. that'll hold this so in, in case you wanted to, you need to make it a short. It's only about it's only about a half an inch long. Yeah, the other thing is you can just do it between centers and leave a chunk of wood here and the last minute part it off. I took my golf ball, which is soft. Yeah. It just drilled a little hole in the golf ball. How much is the golf ball cut? Three quarter inch hole goes over the live center. Little hole. Yeah. Over the you need a little hole in the thing over here. Now, this is the hard part. Let's see what happens. Yeah, it's not going to be Because when you were hollowing, you might have bumped into this edge and opened up the hole. I do my tendon to the hole it's going into. You kind of got to sneak up on it because you take a cut, not there, you take another cut, not there, then you take a heavy cut, and you went too far. And I could set those round calipers and do it a lot quicker, but. too far but that's okay. And then I like to undercut it. I have two of these Chris stock tile style tools. They won't show up on the camera. One's ground flat across the front and one's ground at an angle. To undercut these guys I use the one at an angle. That way when I hit my tenon it's still parallel. And to undercut it you start where the tenon is and you work your way to the outside. And the last 
Remember, I want concave here because so I can't undercut it too much. Yeah, let's see what else you need to know about this. The other thing is when I'm doing that, I have to angle this blade away from the edge so that only that corner is touching. If I held it straight up and down, then this side of the blade would hit it and blow it all to pieces. So you got to kind of angle it back. So we're going to call that done. And now I pull it back, sand it, and do all that. And then finally, oh, I got parting to right here. And I'll just part it right off. Oh, yeah, a lot of times. I'll go ahead and cut this edge off so I don't get cut sand. And if I were doing the convex, the convex one, then I would make this parallel to that and I'd be pretty close to where I want it to be. You only need about a 3 16 of a tenon here. Don't do this with long sleeves or a watch. So that's that. Now we gotta quickly do the cap. Oh, it fit. Oh, cap. Normally I should undercut it more because I do not like that shadow line there. But I was trying to be quick. Then again, if you mess up, then that's. Yeah, I didn't undercut it all. I didn't make I didn't make that cut all the way from the outside in. And then I always like to do something different on top. Sometimes I'll do a little ball. Sometimes I'll just do a little ball or two things. And I'm 5 eighths, not 3 quarters. And then I'll sew the lay speed down. This is a, you can use vice grips to hold this guy. Or I bought one of these from uh, MSC. And I'll feed it in. The size of the drill bit size to your screw eyes. My screw eyes, my old ones, took a, a number 58 or 57. The new ones I got from uh, the Mountain Wood Turners Club are smaller, and I'm not sure what size they take. Well, uh, with this one, I, uh, with really hard woods, I have to kind of wobble it out a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll rock it back and forth and kind of open it up a little bit, and, uh, like the diamond wood and some of the other hard woods. Make sure the screw like this. And then if you're smart, after you've sanded it, you go ahead and put the screw eye in now, because I can spin it. If you do it off the lathe, you got us old folks can't do this anymore. It's a whole lot easier on here. How much work you get that car? I got that from MSC. Well, it's a, a machine and supply house. You probably get it from Enco too. Oh, that's this tenant's probably not going to fit, but we'll see. I didn't even measure it. It's too big. Too bad. Oh, but if it's this cool, here we go. Ain't coming off that one. Oh, but the bottom doesn't fit. But anyway, that's the finished ornament. And now I'm over time, but I just want to, I'm not going to actually do it. But if you were wanting to make these, the whole base for your ornament, uh, Choice Woods out of Kentucky, I think for the smaller size, it's like either three for 75 cents or three for a dollar. Next size, three for a dollar and a quarter. Next size is three for $1.75. Or you can do a, uh, 
Preston? Preston? Right. Preston did is he went to a hobby shop or a metal supply place and bought a bar and bend his own. Well, I find it easier just to spend 75 cents and get three or more he bent with a little hook in it. And what I do to do that, being a woodworker and making furniture, I have all this scrap pretty wood. This is some highly figured maple. What I did is did a compass, you know, cut it a circle with a bandsaw. Actually, before I cut it into a circle, I went and drilled a one inch diameter hole with a Forstner bit. And then I cut the corners off because it's easier to hold the corners than it is a round thing on, on the drill press just in case you try to get too aggressive and the bit lines up. And then what I do with these step jaws, which is what I really like, is I'm going to expand into that hole, pull it on flat, and expand into it. And then, voila, I use a bulb gouge or a spindle gouge and turn a, turn a fancy base. And these are fun because you get to play with shapes. And you can use a spindle gouge. You know that fine, a bowl gouge works better than traditionally ground bowl gouge. And then here for this little bead, I went in with the uh, point tool. This is another little tool you can make. Get these collets and quarter inch steel from Enco or MSC or me or Frank. And what I would use this. Then I'd go in there with flat, with one facet straight up, facet straight up, and just stick it straight in, and then I roll it as I pull it out, and I roll the bead from the inside out. I'm just going to drop and roll it and pull it out, and then on this side I would drop and roll and pull it out. Now if you try to do a bead on faceplate work, when the grain's perpendicular to the lathe with a spindle gouge. If you don't have that wing in the right place and it catches, you lose the whole front. But this guy, the worst thing he usually does is, is if you if you have too long of a too long of a facet when you're rolling out, the tip may hit the bead on the other side, or it scrapes. So it's very forgiving, and you can do all kinds of decoration. I even came in with it from over here, and I did the back side of this, and then I came in with a skew on the other end of it, and it highlighted that that, and I highlighted it in there with the skew. And then you just take the drill bit, whatever size you need for whatever wire you got, and you drill your little hole in there. And I usually drill it all the way through. And on one of the, yeah, I think this is the same. One of these stands, I used the wrong size drill bit. So I went and put a piece of ebony in the hole, glued it in, and re-drilled it. So you see a little dark circle around there. And I'm six minutes over, so I'm going to call it quits. I hope you got something out of it. <laughs>